All right, guys, welcome back to the video. So in this one, we're gonna be building a fairly simple hanging bookshelf. Now, since this is the first project of the year, I wanted to do something that was fairly easy to complete, to, you know, kind of start off good, uh, but also something that would be kind of interesting. So there's two main things I wanted to try in this project. First off is dyeing ash black. I know that this works really well with red oak and white oak and that, uh, but I've never tried it on ash, so I think it was gonna work really cool. The other part of this is that I finally wanted to work with some of my apple wood. Now, those of you that have been following me for a while know that over the last summer, I was able to get a whole bunch of apple wood that was you know, grown from a tree locally, and then I got it milled up, and it is dried out ridiculously fast due to you know the low humidity in that that we have in Calgary. And so I decided that I wanted to kind of combine these things into one project because being in, working with the black ash for the case would really give the apple wood a chance to shine. So right now, as I'm preparing this stock to make up our case, I've decided to do a little bit of book matching. Now, this is mostly out of convenience rather than going for a book match. Uh, if you guys, again, if you followed me for any amount of time, you know that I constantly am book matching stuff. Not always for the purposes of having a beautiful book match, just because it's a very efficient way to use material, especially eight quarter stock. So for our side panels, these are going to be made from a book match pair, and then as well as our middle shelf. Then the top and bottom panels are going to be made from a piece of four quarter stock that I had left over, uh, as well as the offcut of this eight quarter piece to kind of make up the width that we need. So overall, this is about the best use of materials I could possibly imagine. Uh, and you can see here, these are the top and bottom panels and they're just a little bit too wide and the final width I need is 10 inches. These ones came out to be about eight and, eight and three quarters. So we just had to tack on a little bit of excess material to get them to that extra width, which was super easy to do with that leftover stock from the eight quarter pieces. And so yeah, we're gonna go through a technique that I found is very useful for getting a good panel glue up and that's using a hand plane to just true up that edge. Now this does take a little bit of effort uh, to get right. It took me a couple of tries on these panels, but just using that hand plane just trues it up so much better than you can even get off the table saw with a good rip blade. So I, I'm a huge fan of doing this, especially now that I have a nice number seven, that really makes the job a lot easier. And overall, yeah, these panels came out looking absolutely beautiful. Then out of the clamps, the first thing I'm gonna do is knock off the glue. Now I'm using an old Stanley Handyman here, so not a good or you know, quality plane of any kind, and this is my favorite way to clean up glue squeeze out. Uh, then I'm gonna put these panels through the drum sander first at 80 grit, just to take out any cupping. Then I can pass it through the planer to get them down pretty close to their thickness. Then from the planer, we're back through the drum sander to get them all the way up to 220 grit. Now it's nice to be able to use the drum sander here. You don't need it, but it is a nice thing to have because now my panels are fully sanded up and the next time I'll have to sand them is at the very end of the project. So now with all of my panels down to a pretty accurate thickness, we can go through and cut the, all of them to the 10 inch width. Now I'm cutting all every single one of these panels down to that 10 inches, even though in the final piece, you know, our middle shelf is gonna be much shorter, our sides are gonna be slightly shorter. Uh, right now I want everything to start out at that 10 inch width so that it's easier to, you know, take measurements and do all of our alignment of joinery and that from. If all your pieces are the same width, it's super easy. As soon as you start messing around with the widths, then you have a much higher chance of screwing something up. And before we get into our joinery, we're just gonna set things up and figure out our placement. So because these outsides of these uh, sidewalls are book matched, I wanna make sure I've got them going in a nice orientation because we are gonna be able to see that grain in there uh, when this thing is dyed black. So it's really important to take the time now to consider which, you know, where I want all these pieces to sit. Uh, because like I said, the grain is gonna be visible and I wanna make sure that it flows nicely and everything looks good. Then we're on to our dovetail prep. So I always like to cut my rabbit before I do my dovetails and I just cut this all the way through the panel. Now this is one of my favorite ways to do it because it is, it works out so much cleaner than you could ever get by using a rabbiting bit in a router once your case is fully glued up. Uh, and all you have to do is just account for it in when you're cutting your dovetails, which you'll see how I do that in just a second here. But I also go going through now and marking out my layout lines on, again, every single one of my panels, uh, including our middle shelf, because it's gonna be getting some through tenons later on, and it's so I can use the exact same measurement as I'm using for my dovetails on that middle shelf. Now I'm gonna be hand cutting the dovetails for this project purely because I can. 
Uh, I have the option to use a machine, you know, router to cut the dovetails with my nice Lee jig, and in hindsight, I would have done it that way because that would have been a lot easier, a lot more enjoyable, uh, but sometimes I like to just kind of slow down and try to do some joinery by hand. Now, one thing I did realize in this project is that going forward, I'm going to be using that uh, router jig or the dovetail jig a lot more often because as much as I do enjoy slowing down every once in a while to do hand cut dovetails like this, they just never work out as good as I always think they do. Uh, coming off the uh, jig, they always look so much cleaner, so much better overall. Uh, they're much more, you know, symmetrical and even like that. Uh, whereas when I hand cut them, they're never quite perfect. So it all depends on, you know, the project that I'm doing and what it just, you know, the mood that I'm in on that project. But yeah, going forward, I think I definitely prefer the machine cut, but every once in a while we'll bounce back and forth. Plus, if I'm being honest, watching someone hand cut dovetails is definitely a lot more interesting on video anyway over the machinery because the machinery is just kind of loud and annoying, whereas this, this is quite peaceful. Now, even though I'm not going to be cutting the joiner using the lead jig, it is one of the best tools I have for aligning the pin board, the tailboard, and the pin board. Uh, it just holds everything nice and securely, makes it super easy to get everything lined up perfectly square to each other. Uh, I've made jigs in the past that do this, you know, way using some plywood in that, but the fact that I have this dovetail jig sitting there just makes it a lot easier on me. Then we're going to be using the lead jig again to help get a nice even baseline. So this is one of the biggest issues I've ever had with my hand cut dovetails is the baseline never comes out very clean. So using a router jig like this just makes life a lot easier. Now again, you don't have to use the lead jig like I'm doing here. Mike Pekovic actually covers this in really good detail in a few of his different dovetail courses. So if you're interested in that, check it out. But yeah, if you have it, you know, if you have something that can give you a good clean baseline, definitely use it, even whether it's a machine, chisel, whatever you need. Then to fit up the dovetails, I'm using the old pencil trick, so we'll put a little bit of pencil on the inside corner of the tails here. Lightly tap this on, you never want to force your tails together because it'll end up splitting the wood. And then this will leave a little bit of a pencil mark of material that you then need to remove. Moving on to the middle shelf, again we're going to be doing some through joinery on here, but this time we're going to be using mortise and tenon. So this is actually fairly easy to do. It seems complicated, but I promise you if you just give it a shot, it's actually not as hard as it seems. So we already have our line mark there on there. This is the same width as our dovetails. Now we're just going to go through and use the tape here to mark out our specific tenons. Then again, it's just the same thing as cutting the pin board. We're going to start with the saw and then we'll clean up the baseline using the router. Again, I left my router set up at the same depth. So every Everything on this should come out pretty precise.
Then in my original plans, I had this shelf set at 5 eighths of an inch compared to the outside, which was 11 sixteenths. Well, as I was building it, I decided to thin down the shelf to be about half an inch. I just found that this looked a little bit more proportional compared to the outside and overall evened things out. This also made these tenons a lot easier because I, because I took the panel to just over half inch. Uh, the tenons were almost the, exactly the, the half inch by half inch square that I was looking for in the end. So I only had to remove a little bit of material to help everything fit up nicely. Then cutting these through mortises is again a super easy thing to do that does seem a little bit daunting at first but all you're going to do is just figure out your placement and then drill the largest size hole you can get in there. Uh, then you can go back in with your chisels and just slowly widen that hole. You're going to work in a kind of a diagonal and you want to make sure that you're always cutting on the end grain side of the hole. Uh, if you try and cut up with the grain you're going to get weird splitting out in that so as long as you're always slicing through the end grain that's going to give you the cleanest results. Uh, and again, it's something that you just need to try doing. Then to fit up our tenons, this is again, super easy to do. Using the pencil trick, we're gonna put a little bit of pencil marks on the inside of the mortises there, pound in our tenons. And again, this will give us a little bit of a marking on each one of our tenons of where the material is that we need to remove. And if you do this enough times, eventually your tendon should slide just right in place perfectly with a little bit of help from the mallet. So what you're looking for is just a nice tight fit. You don't really want to be forcing things and if you're hearing a cracking, you know, abort right away, but just take your time and it should fit up nice and easily. The last bit of joinery we need to cut here is a couple grooves that are going to hold our drawer dividers. Now these are just a quarter inch groove and again the lead jig coming in absolutely handy here for this project. Uh, I've never realized just how useful this jig is. I, for the longest time I thought it was only for dovetails but in reality this jig is amazing for doing any kind of panel work that you can possibly think of. So we're going to use this to just cut a nice dado going across the panel with a little bit of a stop at the front about three eighths of an inch in and this will just make our, our uh, dividers blend in a little bit better. Then the final step is to just cut our middle shelf down to its final width. So we're taking three quarters of an inch off the back side and then a quarter of an inch off the front side. Then off our side panels, we're taking about an eighth of an inch just to create a little bit of step structure, just to you know add that visual interest to the whole thing. With everything together, we can fit up our drawer dividers. Again, these are a super simple piece. The only thing that's important here is to pay attention to your grain direction. So because we're gonna be gluing these in place, we wanna make sure that grain is going vertically through these gaps here. Uh, the easiest thing would just be to take a piece, slide it in and call it a day. But here again, it's very important that your grain is vertically oriented to allow for that wood movement in the proper direction. Now another important thing is that these uh, drawer divider pieces don't go the full width of the panel. They stop about a quarter inch from the back. This just allows air to move between the drawers and overall just make sure that nothing's gonna get stuck. And if your drawer ever does get stuck, it's easy to get a tool in behind to help push it out afterwards. And you can see here that these two pieces are not glued together. They're just gonna sit in there because even if that seam doesn't, you know, doesn't stay perfect over time, uh, you're never gonna see it because it's always gonna be hidden behind the drawers. Then we're gonna go through and kind of do our final cleanup on the, all the inside faces here. So anywhere where I need to add a chamfer, I'm adding a chamfer. I'm sanding all the inside faces up to 180 grit. That way they are fully ready for finish once we get this whole thing glued up. Because this is my last opportunity before I get everything glued up to kind of work all these pieces easily. Then a little trick that I learned from doing this enough times is that if you put your glue on your tailboards and then pound your pinboard in, this helps you eliminate the amount of squeeze out you get on the inside face. So you're still gonna get a little bit every once in a while, but this definitely helps limit it you know, quite a bit.
Now this is when I made one of my poor uh, split second decisions. Now in my original plans, I wanted to leave the joinery proud, add a little light chamfer to it so that there'd be some visual detail on the outside of the casework here. Uh, because once we dye everything black, it's gonna be, you know, you're not gonna, you're gonna kind of lose out on those dovetails and that. But when I was looking at the case in the state you guys are seeing it right now, I really hated the look of the proud joinery. I, I wanted the joinery nicely flushed up, so it was a little bit more subtle. Now, in hindsight, I really wish I'd left it proud, because once I go through and take all the kind of the different colors and that of the grain and the end grain and all that kind of stuff out of it, uh, having that proud joinery would have made it look a little bit better. So if you guys are going to be building something like this for yourself, dyeing it black like I did here, definitely leave the joinery proud. It'll look a lot better in the final piece. But again, you just kind of have to be happy with what you have. I don't think it looks particularly bad in its final form, but it's one of those things that if I could go back, I would definitely leave the joinery proud because it would look just a little bit better. Then to show you guys kind of the dirty underbelly of this thing, you can see just how bad my gaps and that are in here. Now, gaps are nothing to be ashamed of in your hand cut joinery. They're gonna happen, you know, it doesn't matter how good a joinery you cut. Um, and it's always up to you whether or not you wanna fill them or not. Then for the coloring, we're gonna be using a two-step process. So I'm starting by using some India ink. Now this is an oil-based ink that's meant for, you know, calligraphy writing or printing. Uh, and it's basically just a really thick ink, but it's very important that it's oil-based. So it soaks into the wood well and just makes that wood a nice pure matte black. Uh, it's gonna do way better than like your ebony stains are ever gonna do. Those will never turn wood actually black. This, using India ink, is gonna give you that nice pure black finish. Then the next step is to use a, a black alcohol-based dye. So this is a leather dye from Tandy Leather, and this will just go into those pores and turn everything again pure black. For the drawer fronts, this was again another split-second decision that I'm actually super happy with. So in my original plans, I was going to use walnut for the drawer fronts because I figured that would be simpler. I wanted to make sure that I had a solid piece running across all three drawers. So I, could, I knew that I'd be able to do that with a piece of walnut. Whereas with the applewood, this applewood, if you guys have followed me on Instagram, I've talked about this a lot. Uh, the applewood is kind of self-destructing as it dries and I've done everything I can to try and stabilize it and there really is just nothing I can do. So there's not a whole lot of good, clean, straight sections of these boards. But luckily I was able to isolate out this one section that was pretty clear of cracks. I'm hoping that there's no cracks left in the drawers. I uh, will have to see, you know, as time goes by with wood movement and that, if anything appears. But I'm pretty sure we're going to be just fine. So I had to mill up this entire piece all for a little uh, 5 8 or I think 9 16, somewhere around there, thick piece to take off of one edge. But this is super exciting for me because, again, I spent a ton of money, you know, getting this apple wood, getting it milled up, and now I've had it sitting in my shop drying for quite a few months and I've just been so excited to get around to using it. So even just being able to mill up this board and have a workable piece of this applewood ready to go was just super, super exciting. And you can see on the back here just what I mean when I say it's you know kind of self-destructing and tearing itself apart. That's an area that is just literally ripping itself apart. I, I have no way to explain it uh, because I am pretty new to working with locally sawn and sourced wood. So yeah, it's uh, it, it was definitely an annoying thing to watch and deal with over the you know few months of seeing this stuff dry out and just kind of crack itself apart. But now that it's dry, I'm just excited to you know introduce it into as many projects as I possibly can and just you know try and get my money's worth. So I'm going through the whole process here of squaring up this blank. I want to be able to just grab this piece of wood whenever I need it uh, and just take off pieces you know, as much as I can. So I left it way oversized. The drawer front piece only needs to be about three inches. I left this blank well over six inches wide. Uh, so I just, I left it as thick as I possibly could. And so the piece that I'm sawing off right now is what we're going to be using for our drawer front. So you can see just how much material is left over that I now just have ready to go.
Then for the drawer boxes, we're gonna be using some birch. Now again, in the original plans, I was gonna use maple because I figured I had enough of that around, but I decided to go for birch because this is another locally sawn piece of wood. So that's kind of the theme here is the case of this piece is you know made from some nice ash, uh, but then our drawers, the back panel, that kind of stuff is made from locally sourced wood. So I just thought it was a kind of a cool touch. Uh, because I was using that apple wood for the drawer fronts, uh, using another locally sourced wood for our drawer boxes just was kind of interesting. Plus, birch is actually quite a nice wood to work with. Because it's not quite as hard as maple, uh, it does work a little bit easier. And overall, the color of it is a little bit more interesting than maple. Maple is a very kind of pale whitish color, whereas birch has a little bit of a warmer, yellower color. So if you guys are enjoying the video so far, I would really appreciate it if you go down and hit that like button. It massively helps out my channel, and if you're willing to subscribe, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm just in the process of building up the channel right now, lo really looking forward to this next year of just seeing what I can create, what I can build, and that all comes through your guys' support. So again, if you'd be willing to hit that like button or the subscribe button, I would really appreciate it, and thank you for making it this far into the video. Now you might be expecting me to go ahead and do more dovetails for our drawer boxes, but I was kind of sick of them at this point, so I decided to try another drawer box joinery method, and that is using a you know, dowel reinforced rabbit. So all I'm doing is just cutting a rabbit onto the front and the back pieces, and then throwing in our side pieces. We'll glue this up first, then afterwards we'll go in and throw in a 3 16 dowel to help reinforce it. This is plenty strong for you know the size of these drawers, and you can actually use this in large drawers as well. Because those dowels are gonna be punching all the way into our front and back pieces, these are a really strong joinery method, and they're probably never gonna come apart, and they're probably equally as strong as dovetails in the long term. Then for the drawer bottoms, I had this birch charcuterie board that I made at some point in time that just happened to be the perfect width, so I resawed that down into a couple different panels. And you can see here what that finished color of the birch looks like. It's much more yellow and warm uh, compared to its natural color and even compared to maple. Then for the most painful part of this whole project, making 36 of these little 3 16 dowels. Now each one of these dowels had to be formed, I, could, I have no way of cutting you know, this uh, small or this size of dowel, so I had to go through all the way to the process of starting at a half inch hole and pounding them all the way through that, then going all the way down to 3 16 of an inch. And I can safely tell you that you do not want to do this. I mean, it looks really cool and it's really cool to be able to use those apple with dowels uh, rather than having to you know, buy a small crappy dowel. Uh, but yeah, yeah, this was a lot of work and my arms and hands were numb. I still, I'm still pretty sore in my hands a few days after doing this. Uh, yeah, it took a lot of work making those dowels, but it was well worth it because they look beautiful in the drawers once they're all cleaned up. cleaning up the drawers, I managed to screw up pretty badly on the middle one and I knocked off almost about an eighth of an inch off the front corner. So in order to make the mistake look on purpose, I went and took all the drawers over to the table saw and just knocked off an eighth of an inch. Now what this has left is a small gap between the top of the drawer and that middle shelf, and I personally don't think it looks bad. Because everything is dyed black, you really can't even notice that gap when you look at it front on. And if you guys can in the final footage, let me know. But you know, I think it doesn't I don't think it looks particularly bad at all. So then it's just a matter of getting our drawers nicely fit up and everything in place. And again, this is a super easy process as long as you take your time and take it slow. This is a good, you know, just a nice relaxing part of the project because things are almost done. 
Then back onto the apple wood again, this was just a miserable process having to go through all these different pieces of apple wood trying to find these eight back slats that I needed. I managed to cut through, I don't even know how many different pieces of this apple wood, just trying to find sections that were gonna be good enough in order to get out the pieces that I need. So the first section I got really lucky, I was able to get four of the pieces. Uh, then on the sec to get the other four that I needed, I had to go through and cut up, I think, three or four other sections of this apple wood. Just, again, trying to find pieces that didn't have massive cracks or defects in them. And so the final eight pieces that I got look really good. They all have bookmatch pairs, which was the really important part for me. I wanted each two slats to be in a bookmatch pair so they would kind of match each other and overall just look really interesting. And so you can see all that different color that we get in that apple wood. It's a really beautiful wood. It's There's nothing super spectacular or special about it. And, you know, it's not like it's walnut or anything. Uh, but again, it's something that is kind of interesting. In its finished form, I'd say that the color is very similar to white oak. But the grain structure and the look of it is very similar to cherry. So it's kind of like a weird combination between the two. And I have to say, again, I really like it. It's not a wood that I would recommend chasing out there, you know, trying to get it because it's the most beautiful whatever. But if you can find it, it's a really interesting interesting wood to use in a project. And so for this project, I'm using Osmo, even though this is not a finish that I particularly like, nothing against the finish or anyone who uses it, I just prefer my more natural finishes. But because I have the case dyed black, I want to make sure that that black ink couldn't get on our nice pale white birch drawers, uh, because that definitely was an issue before I put this Osmo finish on it. So the Osmo is going to seal in there and make sure that that black pigment stays on the wood, not getting onto the birch that we have on the drawers. Now the way that I went about installing the back slats is going to be a little bit controversial because all I did is I just took my slats and pin nailed them in. I, this is the easiest way to do it, but the problem here is that with expansion and contraction we're going to get some small gaps opening up between these. The trick is though is that I'm building this thing in January, so these things, all these slats are at their maximum uh, compression. So over the year they might expand a little bit, pushing outwards, and then they might contract again. And overall I'm not too concerned about these getting a small gap in them, I don't think that it's going to make it look any any better any worse so then I can just attach on my bottom spacer and my top French cleat and this thing is ready to hang on the wall 